And all yours, Ty. Okay, good afternoon, you guys. Thank you so much. I know things have been crazy within the past couple of weeks. Uh, so for the general public that may not be familiar with the situation of CPS being declared a state of emergency, let's maybe touch bases on why uh, that happened. Um, and then let's uh, also clarify maybe why DYA has been uh, selected to take over administrative uh, the operations. Okay, so um, what happened was executive order 21-02 um, really authorized the Department of Youth Affairs to come in to actually come into CPS and to um, direct resources towards a backlog. This backlog of case referrals was identified by the uh, former administrator of Child Protective Services during a just a regular meeting um, that she had had with Terry, myself, and the Lieutenant Governor. Um, so uh, it authorized us to come in, I believe the day, well, it was two weeks ago today. Um, actually, this is our 12th day in, and um, we have been with CPS um, actively looking, taking a look at that backlog, as well as trying to make recommendations um, how to, as to how to move forward and to avoid this kind of crisis intervention, so to speak. That's correct. And, you know, since that 12 days that we've been here, there's actually been quite a bit of movement uh, and to some degree, quite a bit of progress. Can you just so, describe, to, oh. No, so like for example, so for example, today, um, we have a number of Child Protective Services retirees um, looking at um, referrals that were actually not accepted, deemed not accepted, but were of concern to us because it was um, inputted in the computer right before we came on board. And so looking at that backlog, looking at that aspect is really, really helpful. So we're, we're trying, you know, different um, measures to address this backlog of referrals and using um, CPS retirees who have the, you know, this wealth of knowledge and experience has been really, really instrumental in attacking this um, issue. Right, and I will add to that, that uh, when they exit or when they retire, they left on really good standing. So like Lonnie said, they, they bring with them the history. They know the services that are available throughout public health as well in the community. And uh, so when they, review cases, actually they're looking at it with a real critical eye and making sure that whether or not we can take this case or whether we should move it forward. Uh, and it's an excellent team. I think there are five of them right now uh, and all of them very good workers. That's correct. You know, and, and as you know, Tyler, both Terry and I, we are um, former child protective services workers. And so um, we believe that every referral is a concern over a child or children. And so even if it's inappropriate, it's an inappropriate referral to CPS, we can always link services. If we have enough information, we can always link services to a particular family. And so um, that has been our plan in addressing um, these outstanding referrals. Yeah, and I will add to that, that many of these resources or our needs or these families are actually located right here within public health around uh, food stamp, around well baby checkups, medical appointments, uh, dealing with issues around orthopedic cases for pediatrics, such as Shriner services. I mean, all of these services are within public health or there are links through public health. And so uh, when we look at these cases, you know, automatically we're saying, hey, they should do prenatal care and they should do WIC and we can go ahead and link them over to uh, certain programs ahead of time, baby basics. You know, that way they're not only doing tests, they know why they're doing tests. Uh, so often people say, I had my blood drawn, but I'm really not quite sure what it was for. You know, we've got programs that actually help explain that information, uh, especially when we start to see really young uh, girls uh, who are below age of consent uh, being pregnant or getting pregnant. Um, so yeah, we've got a lot of those resources right here within public health. Excellent. And can we just get a look at um, how, what the situation is right now? How many number of backlog cases? I know that you had mentioned something, uh, Auntie Mel, about uh, a thousand referrals just within the year 2020. And, you know, of course, with uh, schools being out, that was actually one of the major concerns that we did have and that, you know, a GDOE had mentioned, you know, um, the schools being closed 
um, kind of makes the job a lot more difficult to identify those cases of children that are in need. So what has the situation looked like now that, um, you know, now that uh, the investigators are able to go back out, schools are back open, how many number of backlogs are there? And uh, yeah, let's just elaborate on that one. Okay, so um, actually what was reported by the former administrator who has um, since retired, um, there was reported 1,146 referrals that were received in FY 2020. That's just FY 2020. That, so that period is October 1st, 2019 to September 30th, 2020. So that is the total number of referrals received. But of those referrals re received, um, it, it that, that time period actually had two different supervisors um, overseeing the intake and crisis section. And so we broke that down into one particular um, supervisor received 611 referrals while the other received 259 referrals. And that, that 259 referrals, um, the second supervisor, that's going all the way into December of 2020. So it's inclusive of like the first quarter of FY21. So in yeah, terms so of, the we, of the actual backlog, um, again, we were looking at what was reported by the former administrator was 848 cases that did not have any supervisory action, meaning, um, so that difference between 848 and the 100, I mean, 1,146, um, that was the amount of backlog. So initially it was stated that 100 some cases were acted upon and 800 some were not acted upon. However, when we did come into the section, um, into child protection, into CPS, um, it was determined that 611 cases were um, disposed of, meaning that they were um, not accepted by a supervisor. So that is the, the backlog that we're looking at. What we've done is we um, instructed DY, we have, okay, so we brought in DY social workers, a DYA uh, social services supervisor. So this DYA social services supervisor is working in tandem with the child protective services supervisor for intake and crisis. And so to avoid any continued uh, backlog, we're having her, um, the DYA su uh, supervisor work specifically on new cases. So there is no backlog. So the social services supervisor from CPS is working on the backlog along with, sorry, I'm, I'm getting a lot of feedback. So, so the social services supervisor for CPS that is overseeing crisis um, and intake is currently working on the backlog along with our DYA social workers and the crisis workers and the investigation um, social workers that are, that are still employed with CPS. Meanwhile, we're also trying to expedite recruitment. In fact, we have interviews this week. Terry, I believe it's uh, Thursday or Friday. Um, they're trying to set those interviews up. Um, is there any, anything else in terms of uh, the backlog that you needed? And Lonnie, let me just add to that, that when we talk about, you know, the, the uh, bringing in sort of new blood or bringing in uh, more manpower actually to help address uh, these numbers, not only this particular issue, but, you know, classified permanent positions. And then that way we kind of offset future referrals as well. So we do have quite a number. We we're adding three new social worker threes and six new social worker twos into into this uh, team approach. And that's in addition to the management component regarding the PC3 and uh, a management analysts and clerks and so forth, but really being able to keep track of these referrals a lot closer. Uh, as Lonnie may have mentioned uh, previously that we use a system here called PH Pro. It's a tracking system, it's a tool, uh, in which case it assigns uh, the numbers and it helps move cases along as far as accountability. Uh, and so you really, if you have access to it, you can go in, you can kind of find out the status of certain cases and you can get additional information, which is kind of like the tool assessment that we're using to take a closer look at the 611 cases. So, um, but anyway, manpower. So we're talking about 
uh, recruitment that will start actually this Thursday and Friday as we're doing interviews for the social worker two and then on Friday interviews for social worker three. In addition, um, Tyler, it's, it, there's a bunch of moving parts. So when we walked in, we obviously, we met with the staff, we listened to some of their challenges, some of their concerns, and, and, and we knew from the get-go that staffing has always been an issue. The turnover rate, I mean, it's just such difficult work. And so we asked, you know, what do you need? What do you need from, they need guidance. Um, so they feel that, you know, they need more training. And so we've already coordinated with um, the uh, AG's office with um, attorney Carol Hinkle Sanchez, and she's going to provide supervisory training um, on how to vet these cases properly. And um, she's doing that next week, February 17th. And that's like a four hour training. So um, and then we hope to move on to the line staff to give them, you know, the, but the supervisors need to be ready. And even if there is a high turnover rate and, and we're getting new people, we always want to make sure that onboarding is comprehensive and that um, that new social workers that, you know, that, that come on board are trained properly and um, they're not just kind of thrown into the crisis section right away, that they get that proper guidance and direction. Because again, it's such a hard um, job. It's constant, it's hectic, it's chaotic, and you need to really understand what your resources are in the community to, to help yeah. families in need. Yeah, and you know, to echo part of that too, because, you know, like Lonnie mentioned, both, both her and I, you know, we're part of the Child Protective Services, the BASA team, sort of back in the day. And, you know, granted, we were thrown in the fire. The truth of the matter is, is there was not a lot of standard operating procedures or policies and procedures for us to review even back then. So we know clearly that when staff come on board and they're put into like say a crisis unit or they're put into any of these units case management investigation all of them have the potential to become crises cases almost at any time and so with that said that more onboarding and making sure that people have you know clearly defined roles that they know how to partner with each other uh, how to have each other's back, so to speak, because field work is not easy. The, the big difference between Lonnie's and my time, I think, is the increased number of uh, drug cases, people on meth and so forth, and uh, pregnancy cases in which people, uh, uh, moms are, are on meth as well. So the complexity of these cases, although they were quite complex during our time, uh, they've grown to be even more so. And, uh, you know, we were also looking at sort of a generational uh, concern during our time that, you know, this, this way of, of uh, disciplining, so to speak, your child just went from one generation to another. And if you look at it, you know, literally you were going back to the, to the grandmother who was still living in the household, who this was how she did her son, her daughter, and it just sort of carried on through the grandchildren. Now, of course, like I mentioned, we're seeing more of the meth cases. You know, those cases have a very poor recovery rate, uh, and therefore they're going into case management, and they're literally, you know, you're seeing, again, the generational thing, but you're also seeing conditions in which you would kind of want to be moving towards permanency for these children, but finding out that they're getting into foster care or group homes for extended periods of time. So we, we have this opportunity to look at that as well. Um, yeah, like, like Terry said, Tyler, we're looking at things that, um, like the drug, you know, the drug problem, we're looking at homelessness. These are trends that our uh, CPS workers need training in, and we need to know what the resources are. We have um, foster care issues. We need, you know, more foster parents to be interested and we need alternative placements. I, there's like ongoing issues that need to be better addressed, but we need not only to support the community, the kids in the community, we need to support the workers with, you know, options for placement. And so these are things that, you know, um, aside from the backlog, we are recognizing and they, they are very real needs and real challenges. That was yeah. actually something that I really wanted to uh, ask about because from what I understand, um, children that are homeless don't necessarily uh, become a CPS case. And, you know, with this pandemic going on, so many families, I mean, look at that, almost half of the residents at Global Dorms are children. Um, and more and more every day, like just right here in Harmon, we see two kids with their father panhandling. And, you know, I, I guess that's, that's definitely a long-term thing, but it's also a now thing to address 
because it is a growing issue, you know, is that something that CPS is going to, um, you know, take care of? Are they going to try to change the guidelines of that? Because, um, you know, to simply say that, oh, we don't uh, take away these children from their parents simply because they're homeless. Like, from what I understand, it's as long as they're going to school, they're still, um, they're, they, they're, they still don't take them away. But, you know, yeah. that sets them up so, for a life li in, so a, in a similar yeah. lifestyle. I think, I think, yeah, I think that's, um, that's a generalization that, that it um, kind of is a false generalization in that CPS does make every effort to keep the family intact as much as possible. Um, yes, I know that the prior administrations had looked at homelessness as just a risk factor, but the way Terry and I view it is it's, you know, and again, it's trending upwards because of the pandemic. And so it is a real issue. And this whole entire family um, needs assistance, needs support. So CPS won't abandon a CPS referral, just, you know, that just suggests homelessness. Um, we, we will go out on it. And, and that has been our idea since, you know, coming on board that homelessness ca cases where um, children are referred because they're homeless, children who are referred because um, there's allegations of parental drug mis you know, misuse. We will act on those cases. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, I will add to that, especially around the issues of, of homelessness. You know, to say that it's just a risk factor is such a misconception. You know, we know that the percentage, the likelihood of children that are living out on the streets, regardless of age, you know, they're subject to a lot more violence, uh, sexual assault, physical abuse, poor nutrition, a lack of adult supervision, uh, the list goes on and on. Medical neglect, I mean, you almost wanna check off every single box when you start looking at children who are living in compromised uh, situations and living out on the street. And you know, again, this wasn't that big of a, a marker when Lonnie and I were at Child Protective Services, but now it's, I hate to say more as a norm that we're seeing numbers that are just incredible and not enough energy can be directed. But but for somebody to say that it's simply a risk factor, it's not. Their likelihood of getting all forms of abuse are tenfold increased. And so it, it gives us that opportunity to, to look at what are the numbers that are in foster care? What are the numbers that are in relative care? And, and just how, where is the system at and how burdened is the system so far? And so, you know, in just talking with some of our um, staff that work around the foster children you know we have some 380 children 380 children that are currently in some level of foster care uh, now that's inclusive of things like relative placement licensed foster homes it's inclusive of non-licensed non-relative placements it's inclusive of group homes but regardless of where exactly they're at or what that process is, we are looking at 380 children. And that in itself is such a message to, to all of us, uh, not only in this business, but just that general community. And so at any given time, of course, Child Protective Services is reaching back, wanting to know if anybody's interested in becoming a, a licensed foster parent, uh, that definitely they do have the children uh, that are available. And they just, you know, they just need good, clean homes, loving, loving families that are very accepting. Um, I too am a licensed foster parent. I've had a number of children. I've had a homeless child before uh, who was in need of medical care. And so I, we addressed the medical care off island, came back to Guam. But during the, the six months that I had this child, you know, I was so amazed that the differences or the behaviors of a child who was who, who lives out on the street versus a child who grows up even in an abusive home. And so, you know, their eating habits, their sleeping habits, their hoarding of food, uh, their, how they view uh, other people as far as uh, who are their friends, who are their connections, how they survive on the street. And so we need to really be um, breaking that link as far as these children's, uh, what they're growing up, what they're learning, what they're experiencing and what they're walking away with. And if we don't do them on our, on our level, then of course, this is part of that team that's going to grow up and be treating their children just the same way. And the family, the person that you mentioned about uh, somebody panhandling with the children that are out there, 
I've heard of this case. And before uh, I was back into public health, I actually would see them usually at the McDonald's area. And I was always amazed because I thought, gee, if they have their children there, number one, there's the sun, there's the rain, there's the traffic, anything could happen. But I was also thinking, gee, are they ha does he have his children there just so he could, in, let's say, increase the amount of money that he's being able to collect? So you're looking at people who are becoming, um, perhaps even using the, their children to that kind of advantage. So, you know, Child Protective Services, as Lonnie said, has very, it has a lot of moving parts. Our, our foster care system in itself, the numbers, the type of trainings that are available to foster parents, the fact that some of the children are medically fragile and are in need of specialized foster homes, which we simply do not have on this island. But you're talking about uh, bedridden children, quadriplegic, orthopedics. We're talking about children who may need suctioning, the children that have seizure disorders. You know, there's, there's a reason why that medical neglect is, hits them so hard. And it's because, you know, parents either who are just so overwhelmed by the medical conditions of their child or just lack the ability to even want to be a parent. You know, and like we say, anybody can make a child but not everybody can be a parent and a loving parent and a caring parent. Uh, and even foster parents that step up to the plate, even they have to take that step back every now and then. And so making sure that they're in good standing and that we don't lose that population uh, because of the numbers and the numbers of children that are in need. So I'm just doing a big plug for anybody who wants to be a foster parent. Yeah, I'll do a I, shout I out. I'll do a call, shout please out. Call, please call 475-2653. So and you guys, you guys will notice that Lonnie and I have our, we have certain things that are part of our bandwagon and the recruitment of foster homes is in the forefront. And I'm trying to get her to be a licensed foster parent. 380 um, foster children. How many parents are uh, actually designated as foster parents? And then also I wanted to follow up with that. Uh, can you provide us uh, any updates with the Regalo Foster, uh, the Regalo Foundation foster home? Uh, any of idea of when it will be open? Okay, sure. So just a little bit of background information when it comes to actually active licensed foster homes. These are foster homes that have gone through the recruitment packet. They uh, went ahead and met the needs that were required them as far as any type of clearances and so forth. We actually only have 41, 41 active licensed foster homes for a, children, for a total of 71 children in those 41 homes. For relative placements, these are just extended families that are willing to step up to the plate. Uh, we have 186 children that are currently living in those homes. And as we go down, we do have uh, services of Ali Shelter currently. Uh, that it's a group home as well. And we have 11 children, 11 of Child Protective Services children are there. For our non-relative, non-licensed foster homes, we have 48 uh, children in those homes. And we have a category actually called in-parent custody, simply meaning that the children were removed, that the parents maybe have gone through effective discipline class or they've gone through like drug counseling or substance abuse counseling. And so there is that work towards reunification. And so they may now physically have the child, but Child Protective Services maintains legal custody of those children. And when it comes to that category, we have 49 children who actually fit into that. Um, we do have children over at Sanctuary totaling eight, and we do have children over at DYA. And my understanding is that there are six children that are there. So you're really looking at, um, and actually we do have one case in which a child, an older child, uh, literally had ran away from services uh, and has yet to be identified the location. So one older child. So that totals 380 children that are in the system one way or another. And again, it really is going back to need, the need to increase those foster homes, the need to look at at what point do we really, are we really doing a disservice by keeping the child with the parent? How many opportunities do they really need in order for the child to have a permanency placement? And we know that, that children want that permanent placement, that they need that as far as consistency, consistent love, 
uh, messaging, acceptance, treating children with respect, you know, all the things that a good loving home will bring to the table. Uh, and our children are missing that. We have literally a, a generation here that is missing, missing that support. And we are doing our best to get it in place. But, you know, again, it's reaching out and it's making sure that we have enough of the resources in order to accommodate the high numbers of children that are lending up in the system. And again, many of those, those children, you know, they're victims of sexual abuse, physical abuse, or they're tied in to substance abusing parents. And Terry, I just wanted to ask this as uh, we'll wrap it up soon, but uh, you being a foster parent yourself, um, and obviously we're trying to encourage others to uh, sign up to be a foster parent. Can you just walk us through what the process is like? Um, maybe some people just, you know, just give the public some information about how it is, uh, what they kind of have to go through to qualify and, you know, what your experience has been as a foster parent. So, so the licensing procedure itself to me was very positive. I was very fortunate to get a worker by the name of Grace, Gracie. And so she is excellent. She just has that really nice caring tone. That I think somebody who's managing uh, this population, the, the foster parent population, you know, needs to have that caring voice. So she's excellent. And and it really boiled down to having a home study, you know, can my house accommodate a, ch a child or children? Uh, what what age population am I actually looking for? Am I capable of working with? Uh, I needed to get a PPD, which um, uh, was not a problem at all. And of course I needed to get a, I think a police and a court clearance. Uh, and all that was, was incredibly manageable. You know, uh, you really, a, a good foster parent, you know, are gonna not necessarily see these as obstacles as much as they would want all of the foster homes to be able to say, yes, we are healthy. Yes, we don't have this criminal record. And yes, we do have the best interests of the child at hand. But my experience, just amazing. You know, you cannot, uh, you can't put a price on it. And to have uh, my first child a uh, very young child had very lot of difficulty walking. So, you know, you get used to like strollers and push carts and wheelchairs and everything. And it was an opportunity to take this child off island for medical care to Shriners hospitals. And of course their incredible team over there in Honolulu. And then I came back to the island and again, you know, they were looking for somebody who had some history with child protective services, who kind of had a background with maternal and child health programs and working with children with a disability and really just wanted to look for somebody who was patient and could work with a child. So the second child, again, uh, was one that I took to Shriners Hospitals. We were there for an extended period of time. My, my uh, child went into the operating room five times. So, you know, it really is you know, having that patience, and you know, I'll say this, people complain about quarantine uh, when they get off a plane because of, of COVID. Can you imagine we landed in Honolulu during the flu season of October, and we actually went into a two month lockdown just so I could make sure my child uh, could undergo the surgery in which we came there, we were intended to do. So good nutrition, plenty of pediasure, a lot of snacks, build that weight up, which is important for staying healthy. And you're talking about a street kid who really had really poor Vienna sausage, McDonald eating habits. Um, and then as we progressed, then of course the pandemic, the you know, COVID broke out. So total just within lockdown and uh, quarantine, we were in for over five months. And you're talking about a seven-year-old child in a hotel room, you know, and of course I was tasked to be in like the teacher at the same time. Uh, and you're talking about somebody who, uh, you know, is a little bit behind the, the score, I guess you could say when it comes to learning. So, you know, it really was a lot of patience. Like, you know, the, our outings uh, were very limited, like two, three in the morning, we would go do laundry because no one would be around. I ran around with my uh, Lysol and my hand sanitizers and we wouldn't touch the buttons on the washing machine and dryer. I mean, he was, he was just wonderful. You know, he would, he'd, he would be awake. It would be an outing for him. You know, pretty much we were locked down all the time. I guess my point being is that, you know, it, it takes a special person for these more complicated cases and it takes a loving special person 
uh, to be a foster parent. And kudos to those that are not licensed that are doing it also from the love of their heart and uh, just wanting the very best for their relatives. So I don't think enough can be said, but let me tell you this, you really haven't learned until you become a foster parent. It's one thing to raise your own kids, but you try taking on a child who's new into your home and they just need to very quickly learn your habits, you learn their habits and kind of find that happy medium of respect uh, and acceptance of each other. So um, yeah, anytime that conversation is on my list, I'll be available. Well, that's, I've got to say, that's a very admirable, honorable job that you've taken on. And like you said, not many people can do that. It takes a lot of patience and, you know, everything. So, I mean, it's, it's very inspirational to hear, um, to hear what you've, um, you know, signed up for. Uh, before we wrap it up, do, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Uh, anything in regards to the training that, uh, that uh, personnel has undergone or uh, anything that you want to get out? I'll let you have the floor. So, you know, I, I, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Um, no, just the training that we've already organized and coordinated with um, Carol Hinkle it, uh, Sanchez. That's um, that's a start. Um, it's sure isn't you know the end. Like I said, we have to look at trends in the community, Tyler. You noticed too how homelessness was treated before, and so moving forward, it's going to be treated differently. It is a high priority. Um, trends and you know what's going on with um, drugs in the community that's another high priority as well as runaway children. So training in those areas is paramount for. Um, you know, the new way forward with CPS. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I will give that number again one more time. It's 475-2653 for anybody. You know, even if you're not so much interested, but you would just like to ask questions about foster parenting and what that looks like, you know, it starts with a phone call, you know, we'll, we'll assist you and we'll walk you through and we'll take it from there. And again, right. we're... we're and again, we just honestly, we celebrate the families that do take in, um, that have room in their hearts and their homes, the relatives, as well as those interested in foster parenting. Even with the relative placement, we encourage that they get licensed and many of them do and will help, you know, others. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, both of you for your time today. Um, I'll let you get back into it. I know you have crazy busy schedules and uh, obviously you have a lot on your plate to tackle. So